Okay, we'll, we'll get underway, folks. Thank you very much for coming out on a um, cold and windy Wellington day. Um, I guess we can consider ourselves fortunate that um, we're not on a ferry today. Uh, the, the, what the forecasting 12 metre swells, so there'll be a lot of fun on a boat out there today. Um, we're into day two of our conference, and um, the day is about uh, service delivery. The uh, couple of notices. Uh, remember the tag for this is GOBUS09 if you're putting up Flickr photos or uh, tweeting about things. Uh, the happy hour today is uh, sponsored by CityLink at 5 o'clock and I've just I've spoke to the guys yesterday about the presentations because I've had a number of inquiries and they'll be available in about three weeks. Okay, So they'll be um, basically um, editing them and loading them up and we'll send out an email to everybody when they're available. But the site is up there, it's richmedia.govis.org.nz. Just a quick recap of yesterday. Um, I spoke about a decade of deficit, um, which was sort of a fun topic, isn't it? $50 billion uh, lost uh, GDP in uh, the next three years. Um, Minister spoke about better frontline service delivery with a um, little more money. And um, some of the talks concentrated on that. We had that DVD. Uh, from the UK, which focused quite a lot on um, co-design of services, collaboration, community, etc., uh, and questioned the future um, shape and nature of organisations and government. Uh, we had an interesting talk from Brendan Kelly about person-centric services, moving to a person-centric um, health model. Uh, NZTA and the Commission spoke about reusing government data and gave some case studies about how to do that. And then there was quite a lot of talks about um, sharing services both um, uh, Stephen Crombie talking about government shared services and uh, uh, talking about leveraging hosted and on-demand services, making more use of low cost and free applications. So today, just a um, quick summary of what's happening today. Um, we've, obviously got, we've obviously got two keynote speakers uh, coming up next, both from Australia, so providing us with a different perspective. Um, 11.45, we've got Lawrence Miller speaking as an independent. Uh, and the, the, I, mean, I didn't do a, um, a tag cloud or anything like that, but quickly looking through the program at the topics of the talks, I mean, the themes that sort of leap out at me looking at it was um, user-centred, Web 2.0, and engagement seem to be the major themes for today. So uh, what I'll do now is I'll just um, introduce Fergus. I see they're both, they're both sitting down here in the front row. Um, Fergus is um, from the Department for Families and Communities at the Government of South Australia and uh, he was recommended to me from someone who saw him speaking at a previous conference and said you've got to get this guy, he's uh, a really good speaker. Um, he's been involved in everything uh, from uh, implementing social media to engaging and communicating with staff, clients and partners. And um, the three points for today he's talking about are the challenges of delivering an e-democracy agenda, an e-government perspective from somewhere slightly different, um, South Australia, and the strategic and operational issues associated with implementing social media, which is um, something that Matthew, um, or Matt Lane speaking about as well. So thank you, Fergus. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I noticed it was a bit windy this morning. I was, I was walking from the hotel and there was this guy on a bicycle sort of leveraging himself into the breeze. So, uh, uh, but very pleasant, lovely to be here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, what we've done in the Department for Families and Communities in South Australia. My, my role is the manager for information and knowledge management and part of that is an online service component. So I'm going to focus initially just on what we've done around blogging and especially around a chief executive blog which we've operated and what we've learned, where we've headed with broader social media and also discuss some of the broader issues around e-democracy and um, online engagement and there'll be uh, time for some um, questions at the end I hope. So just to give you a bit of context about the, the department, it um, has about 6,000 staff spread out over about 200 locations. Its uh, major focus is for services with, um, for people with disability, providing housing options and, and child protection. Uh, it's got a fairly um, or somewhat fragmented ICT system as a result of the sort of organisations being uh, amalgamated and it's got about 800 staff 
the, uh, the elusive 800 who don't actually have access to a PC on a regular basis. So uh, they're often residential care workers doing, doing direct care in homes. Little old uh, Adelaide's sort of down near the bottom of Australia. It's uh, South Australia. I'm actually a Queenslander um, and I moved to South Australia about three years ago. There's about 1.6 million people in South Australia, about 1.3 of those are around in Adelaide or around. Uh, Mike talked yesterday about this, this decade of deficit, which obviously Australia is not immune from and nor is South Australia, but uh, we can take some solace in that there's an enormous mine going up sort of halfway up, the, halfway up South Australia called the Olympic Dam Mine, you might have heard of it. Um, it's a 100-year mine of uranium, gold and zinc, I think, is the, is the, the last one. It's absolutely enormous. Um, and so there's, there's quite a potential revenue stream and, and a generation of, of income for the, for the state. And uh, the state's also just won a, a fairly large submarine contract. So it's not all doom and gloom um, uh, in South Australia. Th this mine's quite stunning. I, I was listening to the radio and there's a, they say they need to build... They need to buy every caterpillar tractor built in every caterpillar factory in the world for a year to have enough tractors and diggers to build this thing. They dig for three years before they actually get to the ore. So this is another way to consider South Australia. As I mentioned, I'm a Queenslander and I, this is a sort of a local saying. People say heaps good or heaps fun or whatever. And this, uh, this shirt was uh, so underground that my, my father-in-law went to buy one in, in the one shop in Adelaide and they said, what's the password? So um, he made something up and got the shirt. But I think it's become a bit mainstream. I saw it on a... I was riding home on Friday and saw it on a bus shelter, sort of uh, promoting South Australian produce. So it's, uh, it's famous. So I want to talk about the, um, the, the start of this journey into blogging and social media was the launch of a, a blog called Speakeasy. And that's really laid the foundations for our social media and engagement work. And, and I've just put a couple of the, of the four aims there. So that started in November 2007 as a 90-minute online discussion between the then Chief Executive Sue Varden and all um, or any staff within the office who, who cared to watch. So the blog is managed and maintained by my online services team. You could argue it's, it's not strictly a blog. It's more a sort of um, a synchronous chat uh, where comments appear... Um, as uh, uh, in chronological order, but it's used as blogging software called Community uh, Server, and the term is sort of stuck. So, for the purposes of this, I'll, I'll just call it a blog. There was initial discussion in my team about how the blog would work, and my view was that it it would be something which might augment the regular uh, e-newsletter from the chief executive, and that would sort of share reflections and ideas. But I was shouted down and um, my team sort of said, well, no, it's got to focus on business outcomes. So I'm glad they, they uh, got that one right. I'll just um, tell you a little bit about the, the key steps. That's the sort of front page. I, I got here and realised I didn't actually bring a picture of the, of the actual comments. So I'll just talk to you a little bit about what, what the steps are involved. The first one was around developing and customising the look and feel of the, of the blog. As I mentioned, it just uses some, um, some community service software uh, and we undertook some user testing. We made some refinements based on where some buttons should be placed and making it, it easy, easy, and easy to use uh, and some instructions. We also did some marketing and communication with our media and communication unit. That, that's really critical for this sort of work, I think. Uh, it's, uh, we did articles in our newsletters. We put promotion on our intranet. Uh, in fact, we've got multiple intranets for our, our various divisions, so we, we fed it out to those areas. We did an email reminder to all staff with a link to their Outlook, so they could just click on that and it would go in as an appointment in their, in their diary. And we also did a little audio podcast from the, the chief executive, which the ICT people got a little bit nervous about because they thought the bandwidth of the organisation would, would die, but uh, that went OK. Then there's the issue of uh, topic selection. So we had a few up our sleeve which we presented to the chief executive and then there were also some others that floated in from, from various areas. She, once she'd agreed to those, we just, we just ran with them. We'd do most of that promotion sort of starting about three weeks out and just do it regularly for the, for the period up to the blog. I'd also go around and brief directors who had a specific interest in the topic of conversation. And that was twofold. One was to make sure that they were available or... Uh, accessible on the on the day when the the blog session was running, 
but also to tell them about the, the expectation that they'd have to comment on a on a feedback report. So to close the loop after the the um, the blog had finished, uh, we just made sure that the un, unresolved issues on the blog were responded to by someone in responsibility. We also created some rules, and these these are important. Uh, but they're kept less, uh, less complex and you know, more simple than this would be if it was um, beyond, so to say, community to a government to community consultation. This is all, all behind the firewall, so it's relatively safe. And the purpose is really just to reiterate the, the purpose of the blog, tell people it's not anonymous and it covers some legal issues. So don't be defamatory don't, um, or offensive, respect the privacy of others be nice, etc. I think I saw some rules from IBM which had a nice one of um, don't call your boss a moron. That seemed um, pretty apt. So on the day of the blog, the, we have two staff in online services who sit with the chief executive. They set up a laptop and, and she has her PC in her office. Um, that's really important, actually. These aren't, these aren't senior staff, but they're getting really good exposure to how a chief executive operates. I think it's, it's a really important one to, to do. They're, they're smart and savvy, and they're, um, they're there to tell her how many people are actually watching. They do a sort of a... They're there to moderate, but no one's actually made a comment that's needed to be moderated. But they, they, comments can be wound back if, if needed. And they're also there to make telephone calls or emails or SMS... Um, people who the chief executive is saying, you better get Fergus on the phone to respond to that particular issue. So that's a bit more proactive. Once the, the session's completed, there's a, um, as I mentioned, there's a feedback report that takes, um, it's only two or three pages, sort of says what are the key issues and themes, what was promised, what's unresolved, and what are those areas going to do about it. Most of the issues raised on the blog are actually um, responded to on the blog. So over time that feedback report has, has decreased a little and it's probably the, what we don't do, it's probably what we do worst out of the whole thing is just closing the loop because once the chat's over I think the interest sort of tends to wane a little bit but I, I think it's a really important point for transparency to show people that we've had this conversation, some things have been promised, there's got to be some follow-up. Uh, the really strong point I think from the, the blog is having the chief executive acknowledge issues and concerns and really be quite frank about that and say things like, that's not good enough, I'll talk to your manager, um, I'll put this on the agenda for the next executive team and the sort of the richness of having someone far away from Adelaide, a new staff member who can sort of hit the chief executive directly is, is a, real, a real bonus. It's often commented on. As I mentioned, we, we, there is some moderation, but we've, we, um, we haven't actually had to uh, uh, take any comments down. So these are the topics we've had on the, on the 11 sessions to date, and they're, they're quite broad. There's nothing really controversial there, and they're probably the types of issues which lots of organisations face. So um, you know, maybe they'll inspire others to, to do something similar. Some upcoming topics we've thought about, maybe um, how we can save some money in the department or how we can deliver services in a, a decade of uh, deficit, maybe social innovation, worker mobility. We've got a lot of staff in the field and uh, so what, what are the sort of the supports that are needed for them and maybe something on um, Facebook at work might be interesting. So I'll just show you a few uh, graphs around usage, and this is the number of staff who have commented. So as I said, we've had done 11 to date, and the number of comments, a uh, number of people have commented up from about 18 to, um, to 66 comments. When we look at how many actual comments those people have made, that's gone from about uh, 58 to 210, the staff survey being the, the one which um, caused a bit of... Uh, Chaos actually it was really difficult to just keep track of of the comments. There were so many over a over a reasonably short period of time. So, so, so they run for between an hour, ninety minutes is generally preferred, up to, up to two hours. When we look at how many people are actually viewing, we're getting from between one hundred and twenty to just over five hundred. So um, from about six thousand staff, six thousand plus staff, less the um, elusive eight hundred. Uh, you, I guess you could ask, why, why bother? That's actually not a high proportion of staff in the context of all staff. 
But really, the, the idea of getting 400 staff in a room to have a discussion would be very, very expensive. Um, travel, accommodation, catering, etc. Whereas this is sort of a discrete block for an hour in people's, an hour and a bit in people's, um, people's diaries. There's a few points to mention. We've tried an anonymous blog uh, where we let people, the people uh, as soon as they log on, their, their username comes up. And we tried for the staff survey blog an anonymous approach where people could put in their own username or just have it as, as, um, as nothing. Uh, the basis of that was that the staff survey, which is completed by about 3,000 of our staff, I think, was also anonymous. So we thought we'd just give it a go and people, there were some sensitive issues being discussed, so maybe the anonymity would, would help them open up. I'm, a, I'm actually not in favour of it, especially I think people need to, to take um, some responsibility for what they're saying. But from a practical point of view, it also it was quite difficult for the Chief Executive to understand well, where, where are you from? Um, you're going to have to send me an email outside the blog to tell me a little bit about your story if you want me to help you. And we also had um, people making multiple usernames. So we didn't actually have people going, you know, I'm Bob and this is a great idea, and then Jane saying, wow, I agree with Bob, he's got it all worked out, and they're actually the same person. But um, we could track that through looking at IP addresses and people sort of came up with some bizarre names. Uh, it's also interesting to see the most number of views was the, a round of introductions. So during this process, we've had a change of chief executive and um, people were really curious to say, who's this, who's this new woman and what's she about? So um, that, well, I guess that was, that was promising. So the question is, um, is it working? So we've done um, two surveys. Of, um, of users, and we've got about 100 plus responses on those. And what we know is that we've had about uh, 2,300 individual users of the, of the blog, uh, or people who have looked at the blog. We've had about 615 people who have had more than 10 refreshes, so um, looking at the screen to see updates. I suspect we've got a, yeah, quite a, a small core group who participate in almost all of them. We've got 99% uh, of people have said it's, it's simple to use, that's, that's promising. We've got 87% of people saying they, they see value in finding out what the chief executive is thinking. So that idea of being able to talk directly is really useful. Um, some comments of people saying, well, I've been in the public service for 30 years, I never thought I'd see this opportunity, or I tell my colleagues in another department and they just they think I'm, I'm lying, literally those sort of comments. So maybe that's a reflection of of South Australia or government, I'm not quite sure. But there's certainly nice, nice comments to hear. Uh, interestingly, it's not all about the chief executive and people find uh, just as much value in seeing the comments of others as they do from seeing the comments from the chief executive. So um, often the, the CE sits back and just watches the conversation unravel uh, and people responding to other people's questions, which is, which is really strong. There's also quite a strong support to move it beyond the chief executive to an executive director level and also to our executive leadership team and we've, we've started that process. Uh, people are keen to make it a complimentary tool and just not a one-off, so um, visits to offices, email communication, newsletters will still continue. This won't, this won't replace it. There's um, obviously some barriers though. The big one is that basically people don't have time to sit at their desk while there's customers at the front door. People also want to be confident that they're safe, um, that there's going to be no retribution if they say comments which are, um, are critical of management or, of, or of staff or the organisation or government. And they also want to be confident of getting a response. They don't just want to sort of put a comment out there and see that no one's listening. I guess the reality is that a lot of people just like to watch. They're not interested in making comments. They're looking at the blog as a way of finding out what, um, what's happening in the organisation and you know, what the vibe is. And like all engagement, it's about the topic. Um, all the sort of gee wizardry in the world and shiny new tools isn't, doesn't really matter for anything if the topic isn't one which engages with people and is going to affect their lives. This is, um, I guess we're, we're asking whether the, the model is sustainable. I, I think it is, but I think it'll probably come down to the, that next layer of management and, and focus on teams and projects. This is sort of a bit of a model which we've used to um, think about topics. The original focus was around these business improvement, but I think there is some interest 
in sort of more social aspects as well as you know rallying the troops. So it's just sort of a way to, to report that. The leadership style of the of the host, if you like, is is really important. As I mentioned, we had a a um, it's important in any communication. In fact, not just not just blogging. We had a change of chief executive in about July last year from a, a very charismatic, um, enthusiastic leader to, um, to someone who's more reserved. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I think in terms of thinking about the deployment of a tool, um, yeah, that's, that's obviously a, a, um, a, com a conversation you have to have. The previous chief executive gave quite short, sharp, uh, informal comments, didn't mind uh, occasional typo, the new chief executive is a bit more deliberate and, and takes a little more time on those. Uh, I just mentioned briefly that there's a one on about Facebook at work, which uh, I think two days ago there was a, a, our Office for Chief Information Officer held a, promoted a session in uh, across government to, about uh, Facebook at work. and. Um, uh, that session was booked out in six minutes, so they've had to run four more. So this is this topic of social media in government is really starting to um, uh, raise its head, and it's really positive that the CIO have, have taken a, a stand on it. Uh, so the next interesting experiment in this whole journey was the use of this um, use of the blog with our executive leadership team. So that's the ten. Uh, executive directors plus the chief executive who meet every couple of weeks. And so I somehow persuaded them that we'll extend it from just the chief executive to all of them. That was a really interesting experience and, and very positive. This is a, a shot of the day. It was casual Friday, hence some of the more informal attire. So a bit of context on this. The, uh, there are a couple of executive directors away. They're almost all baby boomers, apart from the guy in the blue shirt, I think. Uh, and they all have different levels of understanding about social media, probably relatively low, I suspect, different comfort levels with the medium, uh, had probably heard of this thing called Speakeasy, but not actually participated, or all of them certainly, and had probably, some of them would never have been to a, to a blog. So my observation was that they, they weren't quite sure what to expect and maybe thought it was a bit of a fun, a bit of, bit of fun. But I can tell you they got very serious very quickly when a question came in that was around their topic of expertise and they, they, they really switched on and thought carefully about a response um, and got their colleagues to, to check it and just make sure it was okay. The, the idea of just being able to type stuff yourself and that's in the, not in the public domain, but it's in the domain of the, of the, um, of the organisation is, is really important. And I think at the end of them, some of them were, were quite rightly, you know, quite proud, saying, oh, I'm going to tell my kids I'm a, I'm a blogger now. So that was, that was kind of cute. The feedback from, the, from this particular session, which was about the strategic plan, so the topic was a little bit dry, but, um, yeah, certainly at that sort of strategic level, that was probably a good one to kick off with. Overall, the, the feedback was really positive. But they, that staff did feel there was a bit of a lack of spontaneity compared to the, the chief executive blog and that sometimes the executive seemed a bit defensive about questions and they weren't really facilitating a conversation. It was like almost like a question and answer format, whereas I think these blogs work best when there's a, a process of saying, well, what do others think or um, that's a good idea, has anyone got a view on it um, and it actually gets people in. Again, it might be the topic. If people aren't interested in the topic, they won't engage. Uh, other feedback f was that they, on something like the strategic plan, they would have liked a bit more time to deliberate over the topic and maybe see some some of the foundation documents which the executive are working on to to um, get a bit more um, a bit more context. But to their credit, they've um, they've all said it was um, worthwhile and they're going to do it quarterly. So that's that's good stuff for us. This issue of um, suitability of, of a medium to, an, to a, a group, I think, is um, an interesting one. I've done a, a couple of three surveys now of different groups, um, about 200 staff in total, just to see this. I've got this loose hypothesis that if you use social media outside of work, then you are potentially more comfortable in using it inside work. So I created this little quiz which asks some pretty simple questions about do you have a social networking profile, um, have you been to a blog? Have you edited a blog? Uh, have you been to a wiki? Have you edited a wiki? 
Have you been to YouTube? Um, have you uploaded to, to YouTube, etc.? And various levels of um, uh, frequency of those things, so from one to five, more than 10, etc. And the more things you answer to that you've done, the higher your score. And I think the total high score is, is 26. Uh, the, I, I surveyed 50 senior managers last year and their average score was about seven compared to my group, of, which is about 33 staff, the average was about um, 12. So age is you know, a determinant. We know that the, the, the managers are more baby boomers. <laughs> uh, in fact, they probably, they probably got a bit of a, a little boost because there was a, a young graduate in the room who'd just done a presentation when I did this survey and she was sort of off the scale. So um, that might have bumped up their results a little bit. Uh, but one of some of the interesting things are the use of, of wikis. That's by far, out of all of the, the elements, uh, I think only five or seven of those 200 plus staff had actually edited a wiki. So wikis are often promoted as sort of a you know, great place for knowledge, but I'm actually not convinced that if we had one, people would use it just because they just don't have the experience and it's not as if, I mean, they're, they're sort of simple, but they're not really, really simple. Uh, whereas YouTube is by far, of all of those social media, YouTube's the most, uh, most used. In fact, but it's not internally, just because of our network issues and some sort of legal issues about um, that sort of media, we don't use it well at all. But I think that's where people would feel a lot of comfort if we did use it some more. So what else have we done beyond this um, Speakeasy. Well, we've we've rolled out blogs in a, a number of areas, and this is the one which is for my my team. So I do a sort of an update every week or two, and it um, provides. Actually, it's um, I've been doing this for about uh, twelve months around really important issues like knowledge management strategy, or um, project updates, or uh, you know, business improvement. I can see people are just riveted in this topic. <laughs> Staff said it was useful, um, but I wasn't actually getting much feedback until I mentioned that I put cable ties. I broke out. I put cable ties on my helmet to keep the magpies away. And all of a sudden, I got this flood of comments saying, oh, God, is that what that stupid thing looks like? Oh, when do you, how do you do that? And it was sort of this, this you know, aha moment of uh, people are interested in people. And that's why they call it probably, social media and social networking. So I, uh, I relaxed a little and, and put much more personal things in there about what I've done on the weekend and, and people are actually much more engaging about that when they see some real life. And that actually does work. I don't know if there's any cyclists here or you have a magpie problem, but cable ties are definitely the way to go. <laughs> Although you do look stupid. Um, and so this issue around uh, content is, is uh, really important. I think I, I found a, a comment from Steve Palmer, who's the, the Chief uh, Information Officer in a, a borough in London, who, who commented, I think, sort of nails it, that, that technologies are benign and the content provides the stimulus. Here's another uh, blog we've got running. This is our library blog. So the library is part of the information and knowledge management area. And this has actually replaced a, a uh, quite time-consuming PDF document which was developed and sent out uh, once a month about all the new articles. Now they just blog it immediately. It's fed out through um, an email subscription service. There's multiple ways to, to find um, content by visiting the blog. People can rate articles, they can comment on them uh, and it's really sort of just creating a much more immediate um, use of, um, of some of this research. And that can also be fed off to other, other sites and including our, our intranet. And one the really exciting thing that I think it will happen in the next couple of months is, is our, our families area, which is our, our child protection area, mostly has started a project uh, called Exchange, which is a, uh, having staff members review recent literature and talk about what they thought about the article and then how it could apply in a, in a sort of a policy and practice sense. That's currently in, in a paper-based format but I think it'll shift to a blog in the next few months, although given there's some staff who don't have access to PCs, it'll have to continue somewhat in paper. But the idea of staff being able to comment on articles, on research, for other people to comment on those views, I think it's great. It's really good knowledge sharing. It's good recognition for staff that they're, they're active in the field, and um, I think it's, a, it's a, a good recognition of some staff expertise. You know, Organisations have a lot of really smart people, 
and I don't think we actually tap into that stuff. And, and this, for some audiences, is a really useful way. Uh, the final one I've got is we're using it as a bit of a consultation uh, platform. So we have a, a big project of ra running out a, a case management system in, in families, and a new case management system. So the project team are using it as a way of, of going to their stakeholders and saying, there's about 150 of them saying, well, this new system will propose to do X, Y and Z. What do you think? And they run a little consultation over a two-week period to, to capture those comments. And in fact, the, the manager of that project team goes into the comments and responds sort of straight away so people can see um, what's, actually happen, uh, what's actually happening. And there's a sort of a feedback loop. People can also uh, rate that particular issue. They can do the subscription and they can also add attachments. So it's, it works pretty well. So um, I'm really just talking about blogging here and this is all behind the firewall, but here are some sort of good old South Australian heaps good tips. Uh, I was trying to think which is the most important of these and, and they're, all, they're all doable and they're all important and they're not, um, they're not extremely complex. Um, yeah, we're not sort of building the, the space shuttle here, so it's, it's, uh, they're all doable. One issue I could probably extend to this I was thinking about is, the, is there's a balance between control and providing people with the freedom to explore and to play uh, but also make them responsible for what they do. So that needs to be thought of a little, little um, cleverly. We haven't imposed really onerous governance, but I do insist that if someone's going to start a blog, they at least do a project brief to say what the hell they're trying to, what the hell they're trying to achieve, and have some commitment to measure that. And I sort of hassle them if they if they don't. So the interest in, in blogging was really the catalyst for a paper which I did to our ICT council around social media. There's really, um, you know, people, ICT, I think, our ICT get a little bit nervous about the web. Uh, and so it's been a process of, of education. But even the chief uh, information officer, his daughter went overseas, so he got onto Facebook. So he was sort of you know, proud of uh, um, climbing that wall and good on him. So our initial, this is our really initial focus. We identified some drivers, which um, almost objectives. We were, these were small projects. Um, they were safe, and it was really just a way of, of trying to get used to it. Where we've come to now is that we've, um, we've expanded a little bit. We've dropped off a couple of blogs which weren't really working. And that's probably a useful point. If these things are so easy to set up that if they don't work, just get rid of them. Um, it's, not, it's not a big deal. People can find another thing. Uh, we've meant, we've uh, started uh, an executive director blog, which which was quite successful, and we've also started on aggregating some of that content on the blogs to our intranet uh, via sort of news pages, uh, and we've also done some dabbling just a little bit beyond the firewall to use Yahoo Pipes. To us, I was in a session yesterday where someone showed that it's a nice little tool to scour the internet to see what are the what are, what's happening ooh, sorry what's happening outside traditional media what's not happening on discussion forums or blogs which is relevant to uh, our organization and what does that mean in terms of uh, policy and service development so if you haven't had a play with yahoo pipes i'd encourage you to do so we've also added some some governance as i mentioned uh, and that's mostly a um, a project brief as per uh, the department's project management office um, structure and we've also um, done some promotion just to, to encourage people to think about how they could use it in a, in a business sense. And where we think we're going is um, a little bit beyond the firewall and this will be a, this will be a new realm for the department and, and at a layer of complexity for sure. It's going to need some policies and procedures and some rules of play. Um, I'd like to think we could extend to some digital storytelling there's some issues around the, the legal use of, of YouTube and where that data, who owns that data, so that's, um, that's uh, an issue. We've also had some interest in Wiki, but as I mentioned before, I'm not quite convinced the department's ready for that in a big way. I think a key point is that we're going to try to um, sort of latch social media onto existing projects rather than say, well, here's a social media, social media project just for, the, just for the sake of it. That's not really how we want to do it. Will we have public servants blogging? I'm not quite sure that's a step we're prepared to take, but I was thinking that there might be some value in 
having, say, a social worker or a psychologist doing some blogs, share their reflections about this, this complexity of their work, which has the, um, you know, the sort of um, very complex social issues versus the reward of, of bringing a family back together, for example. Unfortunately, we don't have to start from scratch because um, New Zealand has, has done lots of good work around use of social media, so you can be sure we'll be plagiarising with, um, with credit where it's due. It's well done for New Zealand, I say. But e-democracy, this notion of e-democracy is much, much bigger than social media, so I want to look at that now. Here's a uh, naked man on a, on a bicycle. Uh, and you might say, well, what has that got to do with, with um, e-democracy? So when I talk about e-democracy, it's probably a contested term, but loosely uh, I'd say it's about how to use the, the internet, um, digital television, mobile communication to, to uh, inform government decision-making. Uh, an e-democracy agenda might also incorporate finding new ways for individuals and uh, communities to, to engage with each other to engage with uh, government, to be informed about issues and also to exchange um, views on matters of, of concern. Does anyone know who this is? Lance. Lance Armstrong, that's right. So seven time winner of the Tour de France, retired, uh, made a comeback, a grand comeback at the um, Tour Down Under, which is a sort of a big cycle race in, in um, South Australia. And that was in January this year, crowds went nuts. 750,000 spectators along the route over five or six days. Huge increase in anything previous. What else is Lance Armstrong famous for? Well, he's a tweeter. So during his stay, Armstrong uh, had lots of meetings, uh, mostly around raising um, funds for his uh, cancer research program, and that included um, meetings with businesses and, and uh, politicians. So a few weeks after the, the Tour de France had left town, what happened? The Premier started tweeting as well. Is it a coincidence that they got on well and, and they're, they're, they're tweeting together? I'm not really sure, but I think, I think it's a great step. Um, this is... I didn't know the Premier was actually raised in New Zealand, so there you go, he's got some, got some good stock. You might ask, why would the Premier want to do this? Uh, he does write all of these posts himself unless he declares otherwise, but it's really being used as a tool to, to communicate, to, um, to promote activities of the government. Uh, it bypasses the media. There's only one paper in Adelaide called The Advertiser. It's a Murdoch press. I absolutely hate this. I mean, media's journalism's probably going down the toilet, so it's just another thing for them to kick around, but I think that's what Armstrong does really well. Just, he just gets the messages out straight away and, and really doesn't have a need for some of that traditional media, and I suspect the Premier's seeing some advantages in that as well. It's quite informal, and there's actually a dialogue um, created between the Premier and, and others, so that's pretty strong, being able to talk to the Premier directly is, is pretty useful. But I guess the question is, does this raise the expectation of increased deliberation, conversation, engagement around more substantive policy and service issues? I guess we'll see. There's an election year in 2010, so it's going to be um, quite interesting. And I guess context around an e-democracy agenda is, is, is a big one. I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is um, another factor in South Australia is this woman. This is Genevieve Bell. South Australia's got this great program called Adelaide Thinkers in Residence where uh, it's run out of Department and Premier and Cabinet and they bring a, th a thinker to South Australia for a number of months who cast their eye on a particular topic. Genevieve Bell is, is in South Australia. She's, um, she's actually uh, South Australian, which is rare for these thinkers, and, um, but she's lived in the US for quite a while. Not that there aren't lots of smart people in... Don't get me wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, where was I? She, um, she works for, she's an anthropologist and she works for Intel. So she goes all around the world talking to people how they can, about how their, their basic use of technology. Absolutely fascinating stories from all over the place and it's been, it's been really great having her in Adelaide. She's done lots of consultations around the place and really the aim is to explore what's the role of ICT in the future of South Australia. Uh, Adelaide Thinkers in Residence is very strongly supported by the Premier and taken very seriously, and so that's a, it's a, a great time for us um, in terms of engagement. 
Uh, one of the great things about the project has been our use of social media. So yeah, this is, I guess, in the context of what, what Blair and Obama and Brown have been doing. It's pretty modest, but this is a, a big step in, in uh, our jurisdiction to really the first use of social media uh, via a blog for storytelling about how people use technology and some really you know, rich stories. People can post photos. They're put on Flickr. Um, you know, there's a number of links to various social media sites. It has an RSS feed and um, and various other activities. So, the the Genevieve Bell residency has really been the catalyst for something, which is um, which I think is is really important. She'll deliver a report in a couple of months, which I'm sure the premier will take a lot of notice of. We've also got some other important projects underway. There's a whole of government ICT strategy called Ask Just Once which is uh, looking to really reform the way, well, one of the elements is around channels to government, and that'll involve the, um, the first goal is a, a common internet site for government, a bit like the direct gov model in the, in the UK. And so that's um, shifting the focus of how content about government information and, and services is written and presented to consumers. So rather than having to find their way through the myriad of government websites, it's about 600, I think, uh, they can go to www.sa.gov.au and be presented with information in a, in a, um, a customer-friendly way. So that uh, implies some engagement with commu uh, the community about what they, actually, what they actually want and need, so that's a good step. There's also a government information licensing framework agenda, which is looking at Creative Commons. So another activity of how can we, how can the community use uh, government data more effectively. We've also got an Australian Centre for Social Innovation launching in Adelaide uh, shortly, which was uh, one of the suggestions out of a previous Thinker in Residence program and it's got some money behind it, so that's really important. And finally, in my own department, there's, um, there's a A3 document, which is our strategic plan, so there's not a lot of room on it, but one of the objectives is around um, developing a community engagement strategy. So that's, that's really heartwarming to see that uh, I think our department will probably lead some of this agenda, which is, which is great. So whether these are the, the seeds of change that are needed for an e-democracy agenda, I'm not sure. Um, it's not as if e-democracy is new. The, the Queensland government created one in 2001 following a, an election and then they upgraded it. Um, this policy framework was written in 2004. So that was really the first time a, a government had said this is, this is our direction around this thing called uh, e-democracy. I guess the world's moved so quickly with these, these new types of tools that uh, the framework might sort of be out of date within 12 months. But I think it's really important that we, we don't just sort of start from scratch, that we can, we can build on those of others. There's lots of US and UK and, and New Zealand examples, to your credit, which um, people, I think people are looking at to see whether they can, they can pinch them. You've got the famous Police Wiki Act, of course, which is just about written about in every e-democracy paper, I think. And um, I stumbled across a, a Wellington um, Council budget simulator. Is there anyone from the Wellington Council here? Okay, I'll have to knock on their door. So let's, uh, I'll just wrap up. And here is, I think, are some sort of prerequisites for this. This is for, for e an e-democracy agenda. I guess you could argue this is probably much the same for most projects, but it, it sort of struck me that this notion of leadership is a really, um, uh, a really big one. I've seen that in Queensland where Premier Beattie came in and, and engagement was the, uh, one of the five government priorities. Tony Blair introduced a whole lot of activities around engagement and community development um, uh, and community building in the UK. And then Obama has really uh, rewritten the, the rule book with certainly in, um, rhetorically about um, engagement. And, and so each of those leaders have put their hand on their heart and said, there's a different way to do government and now we're going to pursue it. So that's, that's going to be a challenge for any leader. And my final points are the, um, these four, I guess. I think there's, there's just massive opportunities for social media in government, both internal to government, but also that community uh, government interaction. Uh, I hope uh, that happens in South Australia, and I hope it does here too. I, I went to a Webstock session on Tuesday night, and, and I found it really interesting, just this, this energy of some, some local um, web developers or vendors um, talking about Web 2, Web 3, about gaming for education, uh, about social innovation, about cooperation. And it seems there's a there's an opportunity waiting to be grasped about how 
how government might sort of harness that sort of energy for um, to help build and grow something for lots of people. The political dimension is a really interesting one. Uh, I'm quite a fan of some of the work that uh, Cisco have done around their Connected Republic. It's, it's a paper well worth worth reading. And one of the authors is Martin Stewart Weeks, who um, has this lovely notion of himself as the, the romantic versus the realist, which I, I think I align with. The romantic in him sees the disruptive possibilities of new technologies and sees how they can reshape views and vision, while the realist in him sees these um, deep structural resistance denial and delay from those in positions of power. But there's certainly room for optimism. There was the Obama town hall uh, a few months, virtual town hall, and so anyone who can um, have a town hall meeting with um, 90,000 people posting 103,000 questions and voting 1.7 million times uh, is really sort of doing something a bit new and, and um, that's a good thing to do. Perhaps ultimately, though, Communities will do as much for themselves um, with or without government. Thank you. interested in is who's going to engage with this e-democracy process. Are they just going to be the same people who would shoot their mouth off in the pub or go on to talk back radio? Or, you know, are they a different type of people that are actually serious and caring about what they put forward? Uh, so the question is, I think the question is who, who's actually going to do this? Is that right? Yeah. Well, I think if you, um, if, if people have got an interest in the topic, then they'll find ways to engage and, and you know, the evidence we have is that people, not everyone can get to the, the public meeting and in fact some people aren't comfortable with standing up in, in crowds and um, saying their piece. So it won't suit everyone, you're right, and not everyone has a computer, but people are interested in uh, government decisions which are going to change their life, uh, a new road, a new airport, and so I think if government can provide a mechanism for people to have a say in a safe and secure way and, and be heard, then I think those are the ones that are going to use it. Yeah. But it still needs to be a complementary tool. Government I can't just say, well, we'll just do it online. There needs to be some balance between those other, other mechanisms and, um, and these new mediums. Um, there's a concern around the technology divide that this kind of um, environment creates because uh, a lot of the poorer people in the community don't have access to mm -hmm. um, internet or broadband, uh, etc. But also the disabled community mm -hmm. in a lot of senses get um, excluded from websites through website accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have anything around that? Have you addressed that in any way? Uh, well, we, the issue is around... Um yeah, disability access and, and, and uh, the digital divide, I guess. Uh, we comply with WC3 standards um, and disability is, a, is a, a sort of a core part of our department. So that, that's actually an argument that's raised all the time from people with disabilities don't use computers to are you nuts? People with disabilities always use computers because they're socially isolated. So... Um, yeah, it's not going to be for everyone, for sure. Uh, the, the issue around the digital divide, um, you know, I don't think that's not a reason to do it. I think as long as it's complemented by some other mechanisms and there's sort of a genuine need, a genuine resolve to capture other people's views, then um, it'll work. But it just in isolation, it won't. Um, and ha having it sort of a, a blanket approach makes it a bit more complex. The disability issue one is a, is a really important one. That's that's going to um, continue, I think, but certainly something we have to have to look at. Any other okay, thank you. Thank you.